Welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast, providing you with insightful commentary and developments in the world of healthcare leadership. To learn more, visit ACHE.org. And without further ado, your host. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by LifePoint Behavioral Health. Kindred Behavioral Health is now LifePoint Behavioral Health. The specialized partnership expertise you trust from Kindred has been expanded to meet growing patient needs and relieve ED capacity strains. Visit lifepointbehavioralhealth.net to learn more. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Frisina. He is the founder and CEO of the Frisina Group and the Center for Influential Leadership, as well as an author, an educator, and a consultant specializing in healthcare leadership and performance improvement. Michael also is a visiting scholar at the Hastings Center in New York, a visiting fellow in medical humanities at the Medical College of Pennsylvania, and a John C. Maxwell Top 100 transformational leader. He is the author of Influential Leadership, Change Your Behavior, Change Your Organization, Change Healthcare. He has authored more than 50 papers and published articles on leadership and organizational effectiveness, and he's a contributing author to the Borden Institute's highly acclaimed textbook series on military medicine. Well, Michael was previously an assistant professor at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and an assistant professor at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. He has held administrative positions in both military and civilian healthcare systems at various levels of increasing responsibility. He serves as an ACHE faculty member for various seminars and his new book, Leading with Your Upper Brain, How to Create the Behaviors that Unlock Performance Excellence, written with his son, Robert can help leaders shift their behaviors in ways that bring out the best from their teams. With that introduction, Michael, welcome to the Healthcare Executive Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you back. Uh, Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you all again. Okay, so let's start off with your career journey. First off, we want to thank you for your military service. Uh, How'd you get involved in healthcare? What inspired you to later lean on the leadership and development side of that profession? Well, my father had a younger brother who was a general surgeon, and uh, we got very close. And what impressed me about him and the small community that I grew up in, a town of 9,000 people, Bradford, Pennsylvania, up in the northwest corner of the state, was the ability to help people and seeing him improve the quality of life of people through the work that he did. And so that sort of became my life purpose statement. I wanted to be able to find a way of changing the world for good and going into the military and serving in the medical department. The military was a way of reducing suffering and uh, enhancing quality of life uh, of in in a a very special way. And so that started my journey, but it really started with this inner desire of just wanting to find a way to change the world for good. And healthcare was a great place to do that. Well, again, we thank you for the service and, you know, ACHE, all about leadership and development, continuous learning. So what are some of the common attributes you think healthcare leaders need to be successful? Something you've spoken about multiple times. Yeah. If you look at the literature, thousands of books written on leadership and, and thousands of articles, Uh, There seems to be some sort of ubiquitous list of traits that highly successful, highly effective leaders have. You can have all of those, whatever they happen to be. But if you miss this one, I think this eventually derails your career at some point, particularly the higher up and level of responsibility and position of authority in leading large organizations. And that would be humility. And I needed to find that for folks because oftentimes we share the same vocabulary, but a different dictionary. And uh, for me, humility isn't thinking less of yourself or being self-defacing or demeaning. To be a highly effective leader, you need a great degree of confidence and uh, be able to uh, make difficult decisions and trust the decisions you're making. Humility is the idea that I think less about how important I am personally to the outcome. I'm not the brightest bulb in the package. I don't have to be the brightest person in the room. And when you have that quality of humility, It allows you to create what I call collective intelligence from a team. And so you start to mine and to um, draw out from the people associated with you in the organization, their talent, their expertise, their intellect, and then real performance happens in that collective intelligence uh, explosion that I like to call the upper brain dynamic that makes great things happen for organizations and the people you serve with what you do and the people in the organization who are doing the work for you. Well, you just mentioned the upper brain, so great segue. Let's talk about the new book, Leading with Your Upper Brain, How to Create the Behaviors that Unlock Performance Excellence. Now, you hold degrees in chemistry and philosophy, but this is more in the realm of neurology and brain science here. So what made you pursue this? Why is it important for leaders to operate in their, quote, upper brain? 
Yes, the reason for that, Eric, is that uh, perf you have two operating systems in your brain. If we think of two different types of software, one is for performance and well-being. That's the upper brain, and it consists of various parts of the physiology of the brain. There's another part of software that runs our survival. It protects us. It keeps us safe from threats. And that's what typically we call the lower brain. So you have the upper brain is built for performance and well-being. The lower brain is built for survival. Now, the brain is great at doing both. It just won't do both at the same time. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night with work anxiety, if you have what's called Sunday night, Monday morning work anxiety dynamics, your brain is working in a way of trying to get you motivated to go to work to survive. And so you're in your lower brain. So all your executive skill functions, creativity, imagination, innovation, being able to take prudent risk and being uh, comfortable with risk taking, critical thinking, all of those skill sets reside in the upper brain. And if you can't get in that part of your brain and the neurochemical dynamic of the brain with cortisol being emitted from the lower brain physiology shuts down that upper brain. So you're focusing on protection and safety versus focusing on performance and well-being. For fun, I like to call this neurochemical bartending. If you as a leader know how to behave in such a way that it lights up the upper brain of your team members, they'll follow you anywhere. And, and so that's what the book is designed to do, to teach leaders, one, how to get in their own upper brain, and then how to lead their team members in their upper brain in the most difficult, challenging, uh, high degree of negative stress environment possible. All right, we're going to ask you to be our neurochemical bartender here without giving too much away <laughs> of what's in the book. How can we talk to leaders, healthcare leaders especially, about getting to that point consistently? Uh, first, it starts with self-awareness. Uh, we have an assessment tool. That, and again, what I want to underscore about the work that we're doing, it is evidence-based and science-based. By, by that, I mean we're focusing on behavior, not personality. Right? Behavior is something that you can observe, and behavior is something you can measure. When you have those two criteria, then you're talking about something that can be evidence-based. Everybody knows what it means to experience behavior from another person. And so we call your behavior as a leader event dynamics in the brains of other people. And how I choose to make reference and to focus and to try to make sense of your behavior toward me determines whether I go upper brain or lower brain. So individual leader behavior is the singular most important predictor to how team members will perform. If, an, if a leader is behaving in their upper brain, that's a very positive, open, safe work dynamic. It opens up all the team members to go upper brain. If that leader is in their own lower brain and they're struggling with negative stress dynamics and they're struggling with fear, loss and doubt and frustration and unresolved conflict, then they're setting a tone for the brains of their team members to follow that pathway as well. And so... For example, in my own assessment with the tool that we have, I have key behaviors that identify my upper brain and key behaviors that identify my lower brain. For example, uh, I'm known to be a very positive, enthusiastic person. And so I'll display a positive attitude regarding outcomes. I tend to have a very positive attitude toward potential success, not in an unreasonable way. I understand the difficulties and challenges, but I look at these challenges as opportunities to achieve and to solve problems and create uh, more positive outcomes, optimal outcomes, than going in, in a negative way and pessimism. So when I'm behaving like that, people around me who know what my upper brain behavior dynamics are, oh, I'm in a good place. But when I go lower brain, I start to get very um, ambivalent. I, I can't commit to a decision. Uh, I can get angry at times. I can become careless and disorganized. So when I start displaying those behaviors, I know I'm in my lower brain. So the self-awareness component is critical. If I know my upper brain behaviors, which I do, and I know my lower brain behaviors, which I do, and I know what behavior events or external environmental events can trigger my fear response brain, which is the lower brain is, as soon as I recognize self-aware and self-manage, then I can move myself back up to the upper brain. And the way that I do that, instead of focusing on the fear threat of the event, I start to ask discovery questions. Fear questions always start with why. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? But upper brain questions start with discovery questions like, what does this event mean? What does this behavior mean? Uh, what could be going on in the life of this other person that's making them behave toward me in a way that is disrespectful or lacks courtesy or is demeaning and devaluing? And so it starts to give me a little bit of empathy towards the behavior of the other person and seeking to discover 
And then as soon as I get in that discovery mode, I start to move from my lower brain back to my upper brain. And instead of cortisol, I start to get some serotonin. I start to get some oxytocin. I start to get a little energy again for dopamine, looking for a more positive outcome. And hence, I'm now leading myself to my upper brain and can lead others there as well. This is fascinating. And, and then one of the points that you make in the book, um, you're, you're touching on it a little bit, is that, you know, while, they're at, while leaders' actions are certainly important, their private thoughts, their inner monologue, if you will, uh, is just an, is a, as important. So kind of walk us through that process. Sure. It's a cause and effect relationship. And again, this is what makes it very evidence-based, you know, that we can focus on a set of, of causes and effects. So everything starts with your thinking. So when you experience behavior in another person or you're experiencing a life event, uh, you get a, a, a troubling medical diagnosis, uh, or you get word that the organization is going to start downsizing and you don't know if you're going to have your job tomorrow, you know, things that pose threat to the brain, right? How you start framing those events and making inferences and judgments about those events determines the pathway in cause and effect from your thoughts into emotions. And emotions exist to tell us how we feel about what we're thinking. So if you have a negative emotion, you have to be thinking negatively. If you have a positive emotion, you have to be thinking positively, cause and effect. And there are two separate pathways. The positive pathway takes you to the upper brain and the lower pathway takes you, or the negative pathway takes you to the lower brain. So I have a thought. I start processing thought, inference, judgments. What does this mean? Then I start creating emotion off of what I'm thinking, positively or negatively. That emotion then creates energy, positive or negative energy. Positive energy, critical reasoning, problem solving, innovation, creativity. I'm going to make something good happen out of this mess. The lower brain is all about survival. So now it's, what do I need to do to get safe? How can I protect myself? And it starts to become very inward and self-focused, which is just the opposite of what effective leadership needs to be. And that is other centered and other focused and more of others and less of self. And then the last part of this cause and effect chain reaction is the ultimate behavior that follows. And so if I've gone positive toward the upper brain, my behaviors are going to be more positive and supportive. And if I've gone on the lower brain cause and effect chain reaction, I'm going to my lower brain. I'm going to get more self-focused. I'm going to turn inward. Uh, my behavior can become um, volatile. Um, I've experienced a lot of anger. Uh, in leaders who have gone to their lower brain. And the other uh, form of a lower brain response is to go inward and become very uh, self-protecting, withdraw, get very quiet, don't share information, start to get very self-protective of making it seem like somebody's going to lose in this situation. It's not going to be me. And that's a very typical lower brain leader response when they're in a high negative stress environment. Just a reminder for our listeners, Kindred Behavioral Health is now LifePoint Behavioral Health. The specialized partnership expertise you trust from Kindred has been expanded to meet growing patient needs and relieve ED capacity strains. Visit lifepointbehavioralhealth.net to learn more. Have you been in a situation or have you suggested to other healthcare leaders to sometimes just call it out like, hey, I can, I can see you're operating from your lower brain right now, or I'm in my upper brain, and you can completely tell when there's a disconnect between who's operating with what system? Yeah, I've done that. And uh, in a number of venues, I've done it when I've been a subordinate to a leader. And um, again, words matter to how the brain affects. So I, I would never say I'm calling somebody out. Right. What I'm trying to do is inform somebody. I'm trying to bring a sense of social awareness to an individual. Because once you go lower brain, you can go into a blind spot and you don't see the behaviors you're exhibiting. Uh, so uh, using a term coaching up. Uh, using uh, just the, the, the kindness, just doing someone an act of kindness. When you say, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Do you know that you're being very um, angry right now? Have you, did you notice that you're being angry? You know, you're expressing anger in this meeting. Uh, do you know that you become very self-focused? You're dominating the conversation and you're not letting any of us get an opportunity to share our thoughts and ideas. Uh, are you aware of that? And just just ask a question about, their awareness to their disruptive behavior. And, uh, but you can't just do this without having pre established a relationship right. that allows you to do this with someone. Now, I've done it with, I've done it with total strangers. You know, when someone's being rude to me, I say, Excuse me, um, did you know you're being rude to me at the moment? And I'm wondering why. Do you need help? Are you under a great deal of negative stress? The first thing that I recommend that you do to stay in your own upper brain and don't let 
a, a negative or toxic behavior affect you negatively is to try to understand what could be driving this negative behavior in the other person. You know, you sort of, it used to be get in their shoes. I call it now, just get in their brain. What kind of stress are they under? What kind of fear dynamic is expressing in their life? And you calm that down for them. You say, look, I don't mind letting you go first. And uh, I just want to know why you would behave this way, because in the long term, you've got to know that this kind of behavior isn't going to serve you well. Yeah, so you have in, compassion for the other person, basically. And it goes into the, that self-awareness component you were just talking about and, and, you know, where studies have shown healthcare leaders trying to understand very well need uh, to understand the development and the investment in emerging leaders within their organizations. And we've talked about this before on the podcast, yet sometimes the field is seemingly in constant crisis mode and those investments don't get made. So how can leaders begin to move from just aspiring to develop emerging leaders like we talk about to actually doing it? Yeah, first thing is you're going to take your time to investigate what kind of uh, consultant, leadership consultant or leadership model you're going to bring into the organization. Uh, one of the things that just drives employees of the organization to their lower brain is the fat of the month thing. Mm -hmm. and, and you hear it in their conversation. They're going to do it to us again. You know, last month we took this assessment. Last year we took this assessment. And what a leader needs to do is really take the time to vet, if you will, investigate and validate the concept and the credibility of whatever leadership development system someone's trying to sell them. And then once they do that, they've done their due diligence, they need to run a pilot on one of the departments or a group of members of the organization to validate that whatever your key performance indicators are, whatever wellness, engagement versus burnout dynamic you want to measure, that the system worked. Uh, before you go wholesale through 3,000 people of an organization or 300 people of an organization or 30 people of a team. And, and my, my sense is, and my experience with a lot of senior leaders, they're in too much of a hurry to put something in place so they can say we're doing something, not yet being willing to know that they're going to get the outcome they desire. And so that system fails, and then they go repeat the same dynamic with a different consultant, and then a different one, and then a different one. You've got to do your due diligence. And I've got criteria in the book that guide you as a leader into how to do that due diligence so that you're getting a credible information, you're getting a, a, a system that will work and prove itself. And then you've got to stay with it long time until you get results. And some of these results can take a year to a year and a half, because when you are misbehaving as a leader, you undermine the trust dynamic between you as a leader and the members of your team. And once you valid, uh, violate that trust dynamic, it can take a long time, six months, eight months of consistent behavior change, rebuilding that trust to where people are now willing to leave their lower brain, no longer feeling threat to get to their upper brain so they can start driving performance. So we don't look to measure any key performance indicators until at least after six months, because mm -hmm. uh, we've got to give the brain a chance to literally stabilize itself and shift from the fear dynamic operating software into the performance and well-being software. Now, you wrote this book, this is so cool, with your son, Robert. So what was that like to collaborate with him on a project of this scale? Uh, Bobby's an amazing guy. He's military as well. He has a broad range of worldwide experience. Uh, his master's degree is in international diplomacy. In his combat deployment, he worked as a negotiator in conflict resolution among Afghan tribal leaders uh, and the Taliban. So he has just got a unique worldwide experience of validating that the concepts that we've written about and that we validated in our own team development work with leaders and their teams is that it's universal to all human beings. We've taught and trained these concepts in Japan, in Thailand, in Korea, seven Middle Eastern countries. Uh, I taught a group of physicians from China on these concepts. We've been in Germany and England, uh, Canada, uh, two uh, Central American countries. And uh, so the book was just a natural aha kind of thing saying, why don't we just take what we've experienced together and put it in a book? And uh, we did. And I, I can't tell you what a joy, a thrill, and an absolute blessing it was to be able to have an opportunity like this with one of your adult kids. He's 40. He's on the cusp of millennial Gen X. And when we were saying bad things about millennials and we were saying bad things about Gen X and all the professional literature, he was blowing up the mold on all of that because he was never any of those things. So thanks well, for asking and letting yeah. me um, shout out kudos to Bobby. 
Well, congratulations to both of you. And, you know, when we have an ACHE member on the podcast, we always like to wrap it up by asking, how has the organization impacted your own journey? So how has ACHE helped you along the, along your career, Michael? The, the first thing that really comes to my mind is relationships and people. ACHE is just loaded with not just top drawer talent in the healthcare fields professionally, you know, physicians and nurses and administrators and all the other types of specialties that we have in uh, point of care people and the like. Uh, they're just great human beings. Uh, they're people you not only want to be a colleague with, you want to be a friend with. And all of my years with ACHE, it's been those relationships. And those relationships matter. Uh, we're all going to come into difficult times in our lives. And being able to draw on the strength and the encouragement of that community of uh, just compassionate people and caring people and sacrificing people and giving people. Look, working in the American healthcare industry isn't for cowards. You have got to, to either be insane or you've just got to have a love for people, the caring for others and giving of yourself to others at, at your own uh, locks of self-interest is what drives you in purpose. And uh, I talk about meaning and value and purpose, and that's what ACHE is to me. It's all about the people. Not that we don't have to have high technical skills. I talk about this in the book. Performance and well-being is about technical skills and behavior skills. But behavior skill is the leverage that drives that technical skill. And without it, and without those relationships, your performance is always going to lag. Incredibly well said. You've been listening to Dr. Michael Frazina, his new book, Leading with Your Upper Brain, How to Create the Behaviors that Unlock Performance Excellence, is now available at bookstores nationwide and through major online booksellers. Michael, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric. Take care, and uh, I'm always here when you ever need anything. And a final reminder to our listeners, Kindred Behavioral Health is now LifePoint Behavioral Health. The specialized partnership expertise you trust from Kindred has been expanded to meet growing patient needs and relieve ED capacity strains. Visit lifepointbehavioralhealth.net to learn more. And we thank you so much for listening today. As always, we will catch you next time on the Healthcare Executive Podcast from ACHE. This has been the Healthcare Executive Podcast, brought to you by the American College of Healthcare Executives. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating and reviewing on iTunes or your podcasting app of choice. And for more information, find us online at ache.org.